the essential art of sustainable software architecture. How can we architect software for now without compromising the needs of the future? In what is slightly different from the usual content I produce and starting to set a new direction as I move into the future and try to bring together my beliefs and values with my choice of career. So there's going to be no code samples today, none of that. I want to talk to you today about sustainable software architecture. And when I say the word sustainability, our minds naturally jump to the environment. Things like climate change. Make sure we reuse our shopping bags, recycle our plastic bottles. And whilst these are noble causes and ones that we should all do, as technologists, we have the potential for a much bigger impact. Software is taking over the world. Every single organization on the planet now is now a software company in one way or another. And this gives us a huge opportunity to have a tremendous impact. Huge portions of the world are using software every single day. Sustainable software is so much bigger than that. And I really love this definition of sustainability. Sustainability consists of fulfilling the needs of current generations without compromising the needs of future generations. And this typically applies across three different pillars. The first of which, and probably the most obvious, is environmental sustainability. How do the things we do impact the world around us? Now, this doesn't necessarily mean we need to be working on software projects that are changing the world. But how can we think about the software projects we are working on and making them as environmentally friendly as possible? How much can we do with as few resources as possible? The second pillar of sustainability is social well-being. As developers, we typically aren't lone rangers single-handedly blazing a path through our organization's requirements. We work in teams, we're social creatures. We interact with other humans, both technical and non-technical. We also work with people we haven't even met yet. Future developers who need to come to our systems and understand our intentions, decipher, code. The way we architect software can impact social well-being. And the final pillar is economic growth. And this is an interesting one. When we think about software architecture, what does economic growth mean from a software perspective? A growth of users, a growth in traffic, maybe a growth in simplicity. When we think about growth and architecture, we want our software to meet the demands of today's system whilst being economical with the resources we have. Also have the ability to evolve to meet the challenges of tomorrow. An evolution architecture is fundamental to economic growth. So let's walk through each of these pillars in a bit more detail and apply the lens of software architecture to them. And we'll start with environmental impact. A report by S&P Global Market Intelligence discusses the impact of moving workloads to the cloud. And the report estimates a combination of more up-to-date equipment and a better utilized fleet of hardware amounts to about an 85% saving in energy usage. And this is before considering the fact that many cloud providers are moving their data centers to a 100% renewable energy. How can we architect for efficiency? Doing more with less is fundamental to sustainable architecture. So how can we architect for that? Well, thankfully, some of the most modern cloud native ways of building systems actually align perfectly serverless-first, event-driven, reactive systems help enable our sustainability. Compute that can scale to zero, can use no resources when there's no requests being used. Systems that react to things as they happen and do nothing when there's nothing to react to. Choosing the right compute for the use case that you have and optimizing that it computes accordingly. That might be more might be microservices, serverless containers. Each has its own merits, its own drawbacks. Optimize the right one you choose accordingly. Think asynchronously. As an architect, enabling synchronous communication 
helps us to do more work in the background. We can chunk up our work and do it in batches. We can optimize the times these batches run, the times that things process, instead of us being held accountable to sudden changes in load from forces completely outside of our control. If we think about the typical web architecture, we have some requests coming in from an external place, our compute, our application, and then they maybe get stored off into some database or some persistent storage. Our compute in this instance is completely tied to the load coming in from an external source, a source we have no control over. That may be external to your organization. It may be another team within your organization. Our usage of our compute, UG usage, is directly tied to a force completely out of our control. So if we switch this around slightly, if we start to store the data first and process it later, we can now be much more efficient with our usage of our compute. A sudden spike, our compute can work through that when it's ready without a fear of dropping requests. We can scale more easily. We can additional compute and remove that compute again at times that are convenient to us, safe in the knowledge that if requests come in when our compute isn't there, they'll be stored, ready to be processed later. A knock-on effect this more sustainable architecture is also an increased reliability and even a faster and more consistent response time because we're leveraging technologies native to our cloud provider of choice to store data that comes in directly in a durable way. And in the coming weeks and months, we're going to talk more about the technical implementations of these kind of patterns. And the final point around environmental is to develop with intention. And I mean that very specifically with the programming languages that we choose to use. A group of universities in Portugal ran a study on the 27 of the most popular programming languages and solved 10 different computer science problems. And they used that to look at the energy efficiency and power consumption of different programming languages. And if we look at the results, the top five, the, the big hitters, are probably no surprise to many of you. C, Rust, C++, Java was probably the surprising one for me. And then we look at the bottom five, Python, Ruby. TypeScript, some really, really popular languages, heavily used from an energy perspective, maybe not the most optimal. Now, I'm not suggesting that we all suddenly go off and re-architect our entire systems to use Rust. What I am suggesting is that maybe we consider the places where it's the right thing to use. Maybe you have a part of your system that gets incredibly high load, millions and millions of requests. But well, optimizing that to use a programming language like Rust will also, as well as making your system more efficient, allowing you to do more with less compute, therefore affecting the environmental footprint of your system, it will also likely have an impact to the cost of your system as well. So let's think about the social angle now and social well-being. How can we as developers ensure we improve the social well-being of other developers and the communities around our software? Well, first. Not all of us can work on software that's changing the world. So if we scale this down briefly, how can we think about our fellow developers? Well, let's make a code base that's enjoyable to work on. Taking the Boy Scout rule into this, this area, leave a code base always in a better place than you found it. Renaming variables, making code easy to read and understand, documenting the code that you do write. Make it enjoyable for somebody to come in and pick up your code base. Reducing cognitive load. Cognitive load is devastating as a software developer. Our brains can only hold so much information in there at any one time. They function more like a stick of RAM than they do an SSD. Sticking to a modular design, whether that be a modular monolith or microservices, reduces that cognitive burden. Especially when you couple that with things like domain-driven design, bounded context, stream aligned teams, teams that are focused on a specific feature, a specific area of your system. If I'm a developer working on the product microservice, I can get fully invested in the world of products and only think about that area of the system. If I need to get some customer information, well, then I'll reach out and speak to the customer team's API that's, of course, well documented and has its own SDK because we're all thinking about each other all the time as developers. And also thinking patterns, patterns 
what enable our brains to make these mental shortcuts. I can understand the intention of someone who came before me by thinking about things in patterns. So think about how we can apply pattern-based thinking to our architectures. And again, we'll cover that in the coming weeks and months, the different patterns we can use to help us build more sustainable architecture. Fast feedback is really important. Dopamine, the neurochemical responsible for many of our modern addiction. You get a notification on your phone, a sudden burst of good feeling that you get, that's dopamine. Fast feedback loops of things like test-driven development, continuous integration, trunk-based development. They allow us to really quickly see all them green lights light up and get that fast feedback that the code with the changes we've made have worked. And also if things go wrong, one of the elements of mastery, of mastering any subject, is to have fast and consistent feedback. So when things go wrong, knowing they've gone wrong quickly and being able to action that whilst it's still in your brain without increasing that cognitive load is really powerful. And finally, making our systems evolutionary, make our systems easy to change, make them extensible. And that actually fits really nicely with our serverless first event driven mindset. If our entire system is powered by business events, that both reduces the cognitive load. We can talk about things in plain English, but it also makes that system easy to extend and evolve. We can add new functionality really easily and allow the system to develop naturally over time. So let's think about the economic pillar now and how we could impact economic growth with our software architecture. And this was the most interesting one to think about. And the economic angle, I'm coming at this from how we can be more economic with the resources we do have to enable economic growth in the future. Let's start with compute, optimizing for stateless compute. Aim for your application layer to hold little to no state because that helps enable the serverless first scale to zero reactive systems that we all are looking for. If your application re relies on some kind of in-memory state, then you restrict the type of compute that you can use to process it. If you don't, you can move that compute around, run that compute at the most optimal times of day and turn it off when it's not being used. Secondly, networking. The network, the network impact, how that, what that has on the environment is actually really difficult to quantify. There's an awful lot of variables, but that doesn't mean we can't be really economical with how we consider things transferred over a network. Using technologies like GraphQL or patterns like backend for frontend to reduce the amount of data being transferred only to what is absolutely necessary to do the work that we need to do. And we can also leverage things like caching. If internally in our backend systems, I need to consistently pull data from the customer service, is there a way I could cache some element of that data within my service, reducing the calls required over the network and also impacting the social well-being of the customer team because I'm not overloading their system, constantly pounding their system with requests to get customer information. And finally, understand your data access pattern. Be economical at the data layer as well. If we think about things in the context of Amazon DynamoDB, DynamoDB data is stored with a partition key and maybe a sort key. And if you're using Dynamo in the most optimal way, you will only ever query Dynamo on a partition key and a sort key. So with that in mind, can we start to compress the data we store in Dynamo in another way? Could we compress that right down as small as possible and just store that in a binary format? That will both reduce the economic cost of storing that data. And with a technology like Dynamo, it may even also reduce your monetary cost as well. And this applies to relational databases, NoSQL databases, having good indexes on your MySQL database will improve the efficiency of your compute query in that database, having the knock-on effect of improving the efficiency, the, the environmental impact of your compute. And when we think about data, there's also the analytics use case, these custom ad hoc queries that people need to run. And actually, when we think of analytics, it's useful to think about things from an opposite angle to be proactive instead of reactive. Where possible, proactively generate the data into a form that's efficient to query and do that out of time, do that out of hours at a more efficient time of day 
that means that you don't have people running these really unoptimized ad hoc queries across massive disparate data sets. Instead, they're running queries against efficient pre-built data that's in a format suited to them. So remember, sustainability consists of fulfilling the needs of current generations without compromising the needs of future generations. And that's what we're going to look at going forward. I'm really excited to share this content with you about how you can take some of these things away and actually implement these in your software architecture, how you can build your software to be more sustainable. I look forward to going on this journey with you and I will see you next time.